Uh, so hello everyone. Welcome to our first online meeting of the Culinary Historians of Ann Arbor. I'm Glenda Bullock. I'm your new program chair and this is my first program introduction. Um, as you probably know, we had to suspend our in-person meetings back in March and we're very happy that today's speaker was able to reschedule her appearance with us from last spring. And we also wanna give a great big thank you to our colleagues at the Culinary Historians of Chicago because they graciously offered to host this meeting for us and to show us the ropes on how to conduct a Zoom meeting. So a special thanks to Kathy Lambert who is engineering the Zoom meeting for us today from Chicago. Thank you so much, Kathy. Um, and a few words about logistics for today's presentation. We are recording it to be posted on the Ann Arbor Public Library's YouTube channel. So if you don't want your face preserved for posterity, uh, or if you're in a witness protection program, uh, you will want to turn off your camera. And your microphones are going to be muted during the presentation, but our speaker is very happy to take questions, which you can submit using the chat feature on Zoom, which you would see at the bottom of your screen. Um, and I will be uh, asking as many of them as possible after her talk. And since uh, some of today's visitors might not be familiar with the uh, CHAA, we wanted to give you just a quick introduction to the organization. We're an informal group of people who are interested in the history and culture of food and cooking. And we have monthly talks, usually on the third Thursday of the month at the Mallets Creek branch of the Ann Arbor Public Library. We're online right now during the pandemic, but we hope to be returning one of these days to the library and so that we can meet in person. Uh, we have two participatory theme meals during the year, except during the pandemic, unfortunately. These meals are really fun and really delicious. Uh, and our membership is just $25 a year. That's for an individual or a family. And it also includes a subscription to our quarterly magazine, Repast. And I have the most uh, current issue right here. It's got wonderful articles in it submitted by culinary historians from all over the place and lots of uh, interesting, very tasty recipes. So if you're interested in membership, you can go to our website. It's uh, culinaryhistoriansannarbor.com. Just click on membership. You can download your membership form and our membership year is September to September. So now is a great time to join or to renew. And now I am really pleased to introduce our speaker. It's Francis Kaiwa Wang. Francis is a journalist, a speaker, an activist and poet focused on issues of race, culture and the arts. She's a second generation Chinese American from California, but she now divides her time between Michigan and Hawaii. She has worked in philosophy, anthropology, international development, nonprofits, small business startups, and ethnic new media. And she teaches Asian Pacific Islander American civil rights, history, film, and media at the University of Michigan. She teaches creative writing at the University of Hawaii Hilo and Washtenaw Community College. She's a popular speaker on Asian Pacific American race, diversity, culture, parenting, social justice, and social media. And she has published three chapbooks of prose poetry, she is also a contributor and essayist for NBC News, Asian America, PRI Global Nation, and other media outlets. Uh, she has many other accolades. I am sure you would rather hear from her though, rather than about her. So right now I'm gonna turn it over to her and I am very pleased on behalf of CHAA to welcome Frances Kaiwa Wang. Frances. Hi, thank you everybody for having me. Uh, I'm Frances Kaiwa Wong, and it is a delight to be here, the culinary historian of Ann Arbor. And uh, my mom is here too, so there's lots of pressure. I thought this would be very fun and casual Sunday afternoon, but my mom is here. So, uh, <laughs> so you'll get the best lecture ever uh, because the pressure is on. So let me um, let me get my screen up here. Started. So here I am. Um, uh, and Francis Kaiho Wong, and I'm just going to be speaking on Chinese food customs and culture, uh, which is always fun, always delicious, and um, we're going to cover all sorts of things. And if you like what you see, I've got three more classes coming up that are somewhat related. Uh, I'm doing a Chinese food customs and culture class at WCC, a three-week class. 
I'm doing a, the search for General Tso. There's a documentary film we're going to watch and then uh, have a discussion, also WCC, and then a Foods and Flavor of Chinese New Year in February at Chelsea District Library. And so that'll be really fun if you want to talk some more later on. Okay, so let's start with the poll. Uh, can, Kathy, can you get the poll up here? Let's see if we're doing this right. Okay, so the first question is, what is the most popular food in America? If everyone could just take a moment and you see, if you see the poll on your screen, just click the one that you think is the most popular food in America. We've got hamburgers, hot dogs, pizza, apple pie, mac and cheese, General Tso's chicken. See what you think and uh, we'll see what people think. So there we go. Hamburg pizza number one, 53%, hamburgers 20%, mac and, oh, General Tso's chicken 20%. Cool. So we got all sorts of different answers. And, um, and mac and cheese, 7%. Okay, so that's really interesting because according to, oh, hold on, I'm not, my screen is not advancing. Here we go. Number one most popular food in America, according to Grubhub, is General Tso's chicken. And um, this is based in 2000, you know, again, it's a little bit skewed because it is coming from Grubhub, so it's what people are ordering uh, for takeout. But I was very surprised to find that General Tso's chicken was number one. And so it makes you think, you know, what do, you, what do we think of when we talk about American food? What do we think of when we talk about Chinese food? At what point does General Tso's chicken become American food? And so that's a really interesting thing to think about. If you also think about like, you know, I think about like apple pie, for example, we always think about, you know, the, the, the expression mom and apple pie, the ultimate American iconic food. But how often do you eat apple pie versus how often do you eat General Tso's chicken, right? It's something to think about. And also that I found out while I was researching this, apple pie only became like the marker of Americanness during World War II. Um, so it's very, actually very new in terms of history. And, and then also, currently there are 40,000 Chinese restaurants in America, more than all the McDonald's, Burger Kings, and KFCs put together. I should add some pizza places, see what that adds up, since you guys thought it was pizza was number one. So anyways, this should be fun. So let's see, where are we going? And here's a since we're talking about General Tso, here's General Tso. He's an actual real person. Uh, he was a, a military general in Hunan province, the 1860s, fought against the Taiping Rebellion. He's got a big statue. Everyone in Hunan loves him. He had nothing to do with the chicken, but that's a whole nother story. And we can talk more about that later if you would like. All right, so when well, we're talking about Chinese food, right? What is Chinese food, right? It's obviously, it's more than General Tso's chicken. There's a lot of different variation. Just always remember China's a really big place, right? Lots of different, um, uh, I'm going to say, lots of different diversity in terms of landscape and weather and everything, right? And, uh, and if you look at the agriculture, there are a lot of d big differences. And this is the, the, in the nutshell, if you look at all the red, the red is where rice is grown. So that is actually a very small part of China. A lot of times people think, oh, Chinese people eat rice. Actually, that's just the southern part of China. Uh, northern part, it's wheat. It's all wheat because rice doesn't grow up there. Of course, now today's a modern day. So, you know, there's, there's shipping and people, you know, can get rice around. But traditionally, like in ancient times, um, rice was only in the southern part and wheat is the northern part. And so this adds to the great diversity of Chinese cuisine. And Chinese, you know, a lot of times people think there's a lot of different regions and with a lot of different variation in terms of the, um, you know, what Chinese food means, what is it like? And some of the highlights like Sichuan food is known to be really hot and spicy. Hunan food also very spicy. A lot of seafood in Shandong province, you know, a lot of wild mountain ingredients in Anhui province, Fujian province. And so, these are, you know, so it differs, right? And today we're able to get a lot of these different uh, 
styles of cuisine and styles of cooking. Um, maybe not in Ann Arbor. So you can get some of these in Ann Arbor, but definitely you can get them in, you know, California and get them in New York. Uh, so next time you travel, you can try to expand a little bit more. But a lot of times when we're thinking about Chinese food in America, it's a very limited view. And a lot of times people just, when we think about Chinese American food, what people are familiar with, a lot of that comes from uh, Toisan, which is in Canton province. Today we call it Guangzhou province. And that's because in the 1800s, um, there was only one international port uh, coming out of China, and that was in Canton. And so all the people who came out of China in the mid 1800s came from that region. And so the style of cooking starting in the 1800s until let's say World War II, all, most of the people came from that area. And so the, the, the style of cuisine is very limited in what we in America had exposure to. Now, of course, everything's changed and everything is possible. And um, there's a lot to learn and I'm always learning and there's uh, a lot to uh, taste and experiment with. But this is, this is kind of why um, in terms of Chinese American food, we're a little bit skewed and that just has to do with history. And then also, if, and also another thing to remember is that things in Ch China change, right? things change all the time. And China, again, very big modern place. It's not, you know, like what you see in the movie Milan. There's a lot of stuff going on. And so if you are a young, hip, modern person in China today, and you have a hot date and you really want to impress a girl, the place to take her is Pizza Hut, right? Or KFC or McDonald's, because those are the places that are you know, they're Western, they're hip, they're trendy. And so Pizza Hut actually is a place where you need to make reservations, you need to dress up. If you wanna go someplace for Valentine's Day, Pizza Hut. Or people actually have weddings there too. And so this is kind of hard for us in America to understand, but you know, if you think about it uh, from the Chinese perspective, looking at what we think of Chinese food, there's a lot of, uh, what do you call it? There's a lot of uh, back and forth and learnt mutual understanding that we can uh, think about. Um, so anyways, if you get a chance to go to China, you you know, people like to go and visit. The, those menus there are a little, at McDonald's, they're a little bit different, but, but you know, only one. Just if you have to go, go once. Don't make every meal at McDonald's. All right, so what's next? Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about how the centrality of food in Chinese culture, and we see it in the language. So this is the word for home and family, jia, and, and uh, there's, and for Chinese characters, there's a lot of meaning that's embedded in the character itself. So if you look at, uh, do I have a pointer? I don't know. Ah, laser pointer. Let's see if this works. Okay, so this is the top part of the word. For jia, and that means a house, right? A roof. Think of it as a roof. And then this bottom part of the word is means pig. So if you have a roof over your head and a pig down underneath your house, that's home. That's family. That's all you need, right? And so it's very interesting to think of what is critical uh, for your sense of home. I'm sure if we asked our teenagers, who are, you know, Zoom schooling these days down in the basement, they would not think, oh, I just need a roof over my head and a pig in the basement. They, say they, need, they need a lot more stuff. But um, I, I like to think, you know, if you go down to basics, this is all you need. Um, and then also the, the understanding of rice and food and a meal. In Chinese, the word fan means cooked rice. And it's interchangeable with meal or food. So people, if someone asks you, ni chi fan le ma, have you eaten yet? Literally, it means, have you eaten rice yet? If you ate a sandwich, the answer, you don't say, no, I ate a sandwich. You say, yes, because when they ask you, have you eaten rice yet? Really, what people are asking you is, have you eaten food yet? Have you eaten a meal yet? Or if people say, come and eat food. They say, chi fan le, come and eat rice, but they mean come and eat food, come and eat meal. So, so all the meaning of these words are interchangeable because it's so central to um, daily life. 
And then also we have, so we have, did you, did you eat yet? Did you eat rice yet? Um, that's, those are critical concepts. When I was, I lived in Kathmandu for a few years and they have a very similar expression, right? Did you eat rice? And the Peace Corps volunteers didn't understand. They would always say, oh no, I ate noodles. And the, and the Nepali people would look at them like, we don't understand. Or they'd say, no, I ate a sandwich. Anyway, um, so there's also, that also, you know, you, you see through the food that nothing goes to waste in, in Chinese culture and Chinese food. And there's an expression that, and I think this is, again, it comes from, you know, frugal beginnings. People, they use every part of the animal because they have to, to survive it. And so there's an expression in Chinese that say, Chinese eat anything with four legs except a table, anything that flies except an airplane, and anything in the ocean except a submarine. And largely, I think it's true. And so be courageous and be bold and try lots of different things. It's always wonderful. And then there's also another expression, sour, sweet, bitter, spicy. Chuan tian ku la. And that means not just the four flavors that you get in food, but also the delicate balance of, you know, of life, right? The ups and downs in life. And so that's when people will eat it. And then other expressions like if, if you're talking about someone who's enduring hardship, you say, oh, that person is um, chukhu, he's eating bitter, um, which makes sense if you think about it, right? And if you say someone is eating vinegar, chitsu, that means they're jealous. And so you can imagine, right, if someone is like takes a big gulp of vinegar, the face they would make, does that line up with your idea of what that person's face would look like if they were jealous? Yes. And then eat tofu, tofu is my favorite, and that means flirting. So someone would say, are you, you know, are you eating my tofu? And that means, are you flirting with me? And so, of course, as a kid growing up in a Chinese-speaking family, I didn't know any of this and so I would very innocently accidentally say this all the time <laughs> and, get, and my aunts would laugh hysterically like, ah, oh, she doesn't know anything. But uh, anyway, so there's a lot of these expressions. They come from food, but they're again, they're not about food. They're about what we, um, what we, um, the, you know, different emotions. Oh, and also uh, I, I bring this t-shirt up again. It's from my friend Ryan Suda at blacklava.net. And it's a great t-shirt and it's like, did you eat means I love you. And there's this, I think goes across a lot of different cultures, uh, different Asian cultures, uh, Jewish cultures, African-American cultures, a lot of cultures, right? You go and you see your grandma, you go see your auntie and they see you. And the first thing they say is, did you eat yet? And you say, yes, I already ate. And they say, good, sit down, let me feed you something, right? So I hope this is, um, you know, Chinese culture Stereotypically, again, this is changing with modern times, but stereotypically is not a big huggy, kissy culture. But we, but every auntie, every grandma will ask you, you know, did you eat? And whether you've eaten or not, they will feed you more. And uh, all right, so the big festival, I promised to talk about festivals. The big festival coming up soon, October 1st, is the Mid Autumn Festival, Zong Chou Jie. And uh, it's it comes, it's, um, it's in the autumn, it's the 15th day of the eighth lunar month. So sometimes it's mistranslated as mid-August festival. It has nothing to do with August. It's usually September, October, sometimes August. It just depends on how the lunar calendar goes. And it, it, it lines up with Oktoberfest and uh, the Korean festival, Chuseok, the, there's a Japanese festival. Just think of it as a har harvest festival because the full moon on October 1st is going to be the biggest full moon of the year. And it has to do with how low the sun is on the horizon. But it's a big, you know, it's a, going to be a beautiful full moon. So what you should do, what I recommend you do first, you know, buy some moon cakes. So you can get these at your local Chinese um, grocery store. We have several here in town, um, or you can even get them at Costco. These are at Costco. And, um, and you can also get like these, you can get these online, shunkybakery.com, S-H-E-N-G-K-E-E.com. And these you can deliver anywhere in America, but they do have these in town. Uh, I bought them in town. 
So first you buy your mooncakes and then on that day, and, and oh, let me just explain the mooncakes. Mooncakes are, um, they're, they're not cakes like we think of, you know, birthday cake. They're not like birthday cakes at all, you know, with the fluffy cake filling and frosting. No, they're not like that. They're more like a cross between say a Fig Newton or fudge. It's heavy, it's dense. So imagine a big, big old hockey puck um, they they come. They're usually either this big. And sometimes they're smaller ones, but you know, it's a big round hockey puck, and the, with a really dense sweet filling. Sometimes it's made of red bean. Sometimes it's made with lotus root. Sometimes it's made with dates. Sometimes pineapple. Those are my favorite four, by the way. And um, and they're baked, and um, and you you can. And they're very heavy, so don't try to eat a whole one by yourself. Cut it into quarters, cut it into eighths, and split it around the, the family. Sometimes they have salted egg yolks inside, and so these are a sweet, dense, wonderful treat. And then on that night of the mid-autumn festival, go out and have an outdoor picnic. Hey, that fits with our COVID requirements. Have a picnic with the family out in the park. Go look at the moon, compose some moon poetry. Uh, you can recite some poetry on your, you know, on your own. And uh, you can make wishes. Women can make wishes to the moon because the moon is feminine. And that comes from a story of uh, Chang'e. That's the lady here. Uh, so long story, but in the end, she goes, she, um, Let's see, there's a lot of different versions of the story, but her husband is given these pills of immortality uh, and she takes them both. Uh, some say it's to prevent some bad guys from getting it. Some say it's to prevent him from being corrupt. Some say it's because she's curious and because it's bad for women to be curious. I don't like that version. And so there are a lot of different versions. And uh, in the end, she takes these pills of immortality too soon. They're too strong and she floats up up, up to the moon. And so she lives on the moon. Her husband later on is allowed to live on the sun. And so they never get to see each other. Now, some people might say this is a recipe for a happy marriage, but one day a year they get to be together. And that's the night of the autumn moon festival. And they say that she is so happy to finally see him for one night of the year that her face glows so bright. And that's why the moon is so bright. And that's also why she will make wish, she will grant you a wish, especially if you're a young woman who is looking for love and a happy marriage sort of thing. All right, so that's the mid, that's the mid on a moon festival. And uh, we can talk more about that. Lunar New Year is another huge festival. It's coming up in February 12th this year, but the night before, which will be a Thursday this year, is the night you're supposed to have your dinner. And the dinner, there's all sorts of, um, symbolic meaning of the different dishes and a lot of puns there's a lot of puns in chinese language um uh, puns and home what's the word homophones right words that sound the same so the key if you can only have one dish so you know how like at thanksgiving so new chinese new year's is like thanksgiving christmas and new year's all wrapped up into one everybody goes home everyone goes to see their relatives in china it's the single largest human migration on the planet like they can see it from the space station they can see all the people moving it's such a huge uh thing but the if so the way that you know how thanksgiving if you have one thing that you have to have at thanksgiving that's what the turkey, right? So for Chinese dinner, if you can only have one thing, and of course you're not supposed to, you're supposed to have like 30 dishes, but the one thing you have to have is a fish and not like fish fillets. You have to have a whole fish with the head and the tail, right? And 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 the fish, and that's because the word for fish yu, is, a, is a homonym with the word for abundance or surplus. And so there's an expression called nian nian you yu, if you have a fish at Chinese New Year's, then every year or the whole rest of the year, you will have surplus. You will have an abundance. And that's because that's a play on the word fish and surplus or mm. abundance, actually. And so you, but you want to have a whole fish. And you also want to be careful when you eat the fish, don't finish it. So if you're a very, if you're, so some people who are good cooks, they'll bring their fish out to show everybody and then they'll take it back into the kitchen and hide it. If you're not such a good cook, 
as me, then maybe it's safe. Just make sure that there is some left over because you want to make sure that you have leftovers in the new year. Another dish that is, is key for Chinese New Year's is you have a whole chicken, including the head and the feet and the neck, and that's to represent the whole family being together. Because that's, again, whatever happens on Chinese New Year's, that's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's some, it will foretell the rest of the year what is going to happen. So of course you want your whole family together. Uh, soybean sprouts. Now these soybean sprouts are larger than the usual bean sprouts that you get at the store. The, the, usually the little white ones are mung bean sprouts. These are soybean sprouts. So they're, they're big. They're like usually three inches long. And they're shaped like an ancient Chinese scepter that the magistrate used to hold. And so that scepter that he, the magistrate would hold is called a Rui scepter. And it's as you wish. And so in ancient times, if you had a request, you go to the magistrate, you, you know, basically you go to court and you make your request and he, you know, will wave his scepter and either give it to you or not give it to you. But so we have the soybean sprouts at Chinese New Year's because the soybean sprouts look like this ancient scepter. And hopefully if you make it, you have it and then you'll get all that you wish in the new year. Uh, the other key, really big important thing to have at Chinese New Year's is dumplings. This is more in the northern families um, and sometimes people will have only dumplings because that's a dumpling is a complete meal and the reason we have dumplings is because they look like ancient Chinese money or silver ingots. So if you look I have a picture of ancient Chinese money and dumplings and you can see there's a similarity in shape and there's a story about a family that you know used to be well off but they were down on their luck and, but they were embarrassed. I mean, nothing wrong with being poor, but this family was embarrassed to be, you know, poor and down on their luck. And so they tried to make a show about how rich they still were. And the father was like shouting so all the neighbors could hear about how they were putting the silver ingots in the, you know, in the fire. No, no, no. They're putting gold bars in the fire and silver ingots. They're boiling them up to eat for dinner. And the, the, and the god of wealth happened to be passing by and he overheard all this and he's like what is going on what are these people doing eating silver ingots and so he peeked in at the window and he saw that what was happening that really they were down to their last you know few cups of flour and their last little handful of meat and uh, cabbage and he felt so sorry for them that he turned all their dumplings into silver ingots Everyone lived happily ever after and everyone makes dumplings for Chinese New Year's hoping that maybe he will pass by and do it again. And so we're always hoping. So um, another thing, especially if you get invited to a Chinese family for a uh, home for uh, Chinese New Year's, that's always a, my, my hope to be invited somewhere. But uh, a good present to bring are, is oranges or tangerines. But don't just bring like the regular clementines. At Chinese New Year's time, you want to bring them with the stem and the leaf. And it just represents good luck and togetherness. And this picture is from bushes. So bushes knows. And so they have the tangerines with the stem and the leaf only at Chinese New Year time. And the, the Chinese markets do as well. So. Um, if you do just bring a regular box of clementines, nobody will say anything. But if you bring it with a the stem, they'll leave. They'll be extra impressed with how, 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 hit, how cool you are. And then uh, if you do get invited, the thing to say is gongxi fa cai. That means literally congratulations and hope you get rich. And when I was a kid, I was really confused. Like, why are you saying congratulations? Until I realized what it means is your congratulations on surviving the old year and hope you get rich in the new year. So this is what people say, gong xi fa cai. Uh, sometimes people say, in modern times, people more are, are more, uh, it's more common for people to say xin nian kuai le, which means literally happy new year. But this, I think, is a Western adaptation. Um, but people say it as well. So happy new year. Okay, so so that's kind of, I, I'm just kind of easing in. The next part that I wanted to talk about, because this is a huge topic, um, a little bit, I want to talk a little bit about the role of Chinese food in American history, because this is, this is what I love. I think this is lots of fun. Uh, so the first Chinese restaurants 
in America opened in 1849. So again, when we're thinking about that question of what counts as American food, uh, who counts as American, um, Chinese food is not new in America and Chinese people are not new in America, right? Chinese people have been here since 18, you know, the mid 18, or since 1840s, uh, actually longer. Asians have been here since the earliest Asians arrived in 1565 and there were, uh, so Asians have been here as long as, you know, except for the Native Americans, of course, they've been here a long time. So, so these are some pictures of some of the earliest Chinese restaurants in San Francisco. Uh, and you'll see that, and in some of them at the very beginning, some were just kind of very utilitarian, uh, hole in the wall sort of food, right? If you think 1840s, you got a lot of hungry miners and railroad workers. It's the Wild West. And so people just want to eat food and get going. But the second picture shows a different view of Chinese restaurants. You'll see it's very ornate and it's very stylized. And I will talk more about why that is so. Um, well, the reason that's so is the Chinese Exclusion Act. So until recently with the Muslim ban, the Chinese Exclusion Act was the only time that a, a, a race, a group of people have been excluded from America. So 1882 to 1943, Chinese were not allowed to come into America. And at stake, and part of the reasoning behind it was really the sense of American manhood. And they, this is like, this is a real pamphlet, you know, meat versus rice. Why should we have Chinese exclusion? It's because Chinese people don't eat manly food. They don't eat meat, they don't eat beans. They just eat sissy food like rice, right? And they drink tea in little tiny teacups like women um, and they and there were other things that they were criticized for like they used they take baths with warm water and soap can you imagine and so all of these things were uh were cast as criticisms of chinese uh i want to say manliness and uh and and then also there were a lot of stereotypes about you know what did Chinese people really eat and a lot of stereotypes about and one of the first I want to say intellectual scholars uh, Chinese American scholars actually the first person to use the term Chinese American in the 18 uh, mid 1800s he said um, I never knew rats were so good to eat until I came to America and all the Americans told me they were good to eat and so I mean he's pulling their leg but um, so these are some of the, so there's a lot to say about here. And I think if you think about uh, with COVID-19, this is actually relevant to what's happening today. There's been a lot of anti-Asian violence. A lot of restaurants have been attacked and vandalized. And also people aren't going to Asian restaurants. They go to, they still go to the Italian restaurants, even though, you know, there's, there was COVID in Italy before, but there's a lot of, I'm going to say, uh, things to think about, but they use food as the way to address this or to talk about this. Okay, but then what happens in terms of US history is um, because of the Chinese Exclusion Act, right? Chinese people are not allowed into the country. There is a loophole that if you are a merchant, you can come in. And so Chinese people start opening restaurants and then you are a merchant you're a restaurateur right you're a restaurant owner and the way people but the key is you can't just open any old restaurant it has to be a fancy beautiful restaurant so like that first picture i showed you where it is so ornate and so beautiful high-end they want high-end restaurants and so what people would do is they come together with a group of people say they have 10 friends they pull their money together and then they open a restaurant, but they also have to have two white witnesses. So they pay two white guys to join their team. And coincidentally, if you look at the, the legal documents of the time, it was the same two guys. They witnessed everybody, like hundreds of restaurants. But um, that's what the laws were at the time. So people followed the laws and they did that. So they opened a restaurant. One person would be like the man in charge and he would um, get his paperwork taken care of. The next year, the next guy in the group would get his paperwork taken care of. Next year, the next guy was, and they would go through the whole group this way. Uh, 
And so in 1910, the number of China, or between 1910 and 1920, the number of Chinese restaurants in the US double. And then from the 1920s, 1930s, it doubles again. And this is why we have Chinese restaurants in every tiny little town in America. If you ever drive across the country, you find them in the strangest places. Um, but this was actually, it was a, a way, I want to say a strategy, a strategy for getting, uh, for getting around the Chinese exclusion within the, within the law. And then also because this was, there was this boom of Chinese restaurants, there was also a stereotype of Chinese, uh, Chinatowns as dangerous, exotic places. And so if you went, so in 1910, going out for a chop suey date in Chinatown was like the way to really impress a girl for how wild you were, how brave you were. Um, so middle-class Americans also would go and they feel all kind of naughty. And, and, and uh, there, was, there were fears, real fears that, you know, you might die, so this is dangerous. And so it's really kind of funny to think about how people, um, you know, took on, uh, I, I don't know, how, the, how people would do this. All right, what's next? And then the oldest continuously operating Chinese restaurant in America is in Butte, Montana, of all places. They celebrated their 100th anniversary in 2011. As far as I know, they are still going on. Um, but, uh, and then in Ann Arbor, the one of the oldest Chinese restaurants that we had in town was Leo Ping's on Main Street. Uh, I did a story for the Ann Arbor Observer, I want to say a year or two ago, about uh, Asians in Ann Arbor, and one of the Ann Arbor Observer readers sent this picture in to John Hilton. He had an old matchbook from Leo Pink, so it was there on Main Street. So if, I don't know if anyone remembers that. I wasn't here yet. And then also the power of Chinese food. There's this great story. Um, when you know when Nixon was when China was starting to open up again to the West, uh, before Nixon went to China, uh, Henry Kissinger went, and they tell the story about how you know they had meetings all morning and they were deadlocked and nothing was getting done, nothing was getting done, and then finally they broke for lunch, and that day they happened to have Peking duck, which is a specialty of Beijing, and amazing and delicious if you ever get a chance to try it and after they had lunch they went back and they were much more relaxed and they kind of they they were able to hammer out whatever the details of their agreement were and years later in their in uh, his memoir Kissinger joked he said after a dinner of Peking duck I'll agree to anything and so that is the power of Chinese food. And it's interesting to see, oh, also I should mention, when Nixon went, the, the menu that was presented to Nixon was such a big hit. Somebody sent the menu back to America, right? That was in the 70s, so there was no, I don't know how they got a copy of it, but they got a copy of the menu and it was the hit. Chinese restaurants across America duplicated those menus. People were going to Chinese restaurants to have them. And it's very different from this, um, this administration when President Trump went to, um, went to China, what he was served is very different. So this is fun and we're almost there, hold on. And then, um, and then a lot of times people joke about Jewish Christmas uh, because Jewish, because the in New York the Jewish ghetto uh, or where the Jewish people lived and where Chinese people lived were right next to each other in New York City, and Christmas is a holiday. Everyone gets the day off for Christmas, but Jewish people don't celebrate Christmas, aren't Christian, and don't celebrate Christmas, and Chinese people also aren't Christian, don't celebrate. Christmas. So that's the one day that, you know, Jewish people, they have a lot of, you know, they're all, they have the day off, even if it's not a religious holiday for them. And Chinese people are still working every day because it's not a holiday for them. And so it's become almost a tradition for Jewish families to get together since they all have the day off anyway, and have a dinner of Chinese food and go see a movie. And so it's not really called Jewish Christmas, but people do joke about that. And, uh, 
And so now a lot of times Jewish, Jewish communities are organized like comedy club, dinners together at Chinese restaurants and, um, and uh, oh, and the other thing, it's very, Chinese food is very easy to convert to make kosher. Okay, so I am almost done. So I just wanted to wrap up. So in the news right now, a lot of Chinese and Asian restaurants are suffering from a lack of business, vandalism, and racist attacks. So if you can support your, your favorite Chinese restaurant, go ahead. And then also right now, there's what they call the Milk Tea Alliance, coalition of Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Thailand allies that, allies that are boycotting the new Mulan movie because the lead actress supports the police in Hong Kong democracy protests. Um, so there's a lot of controversy there, but it's fun that they, they, they're using boba uh, tea as the, as the, um, the marker. Okay, so the final poll, uh, Kathy, we could pull that up. Where were fortune cookies invented? Oh, San Francisco, you guys, it's because I have, it's normally when I do this in person, you know, I just ask and people guess and, uh, because the answers were there, it's, it's kind of a tell. So, all right, you guys are all smarty pants. We got San Francisco. The interesting thing about fortune cookies, and we go to the next slide, is that there is a very similar cookie uh, like it in Japan. So this is a Japanese cookie um, but th that they had, and they had the equipment in San Francisco in the 1940s. But then when the Japanese were put into concentration camps during World War II, um, they had to sell all their equipment. Chinese people bought, you know, bought the equipment and they started making these cookies and selling them in their restaurants. And the fortunes is just kind of fun. And, uh, and so now it's become like iconic for Chinese restaurants. Also, there's a, you know, the story, why is there a fortune inside the cookie? Um, some, there's, a, there's an old story about mooncakes. So we're talking, we're back to our mooncake story again to tie things back to the beginning. Um, with mooncakes, there, there was a battle once, 1740s, I think, I forget. But um, they had all these, they'd been, the, this town had been invaded, there's soldiers everywhere. And they had, they wanted people to rise up on the day of the full moon. But how do you get the message out to everyone? So they made moon cakes and inside the moon cakes, they baked in a message that said, rise up on the night of the full moon. And then they just went around town and like passed out moon cakes and all the soldiers are like, oh, look at the quaint little villagers. They're, they're, they're celebrating their quaint little customs. And uh, they, you know, they were a different from another country. So they couldn't be Chinese anyway. So then everyone got the message and then they rose up and they overthrew the, their oppressors. And so some people think that's where the idea of the fortunes come from. And so when I was little, we never got fortune cookies when we went to Chinese restaurants. We would see all the other people in the restaurant would have it, but we would get a plate of oranges instead. And I went to China in the 1980s and there were no fortune cookies there either. So this is really interesting. It's very much an American invention and, uh, and uh, but that people think of as China. And so if you go to China, you may, you may not see them there. I think nowadays they have them, but, uh, and okay. So I think that is, that is for, that is me. So that is, that's where I want to end, sorry. Um, so do you want to open it up to questions? Oh, we're right on time, I think. Yeah, if, uh, if people have questions and they want to submit them in chat, that would be fantastic. Um, I guess, Francis, a question I would have is what, what are dishes that are, that are served in Chinese restaurants in the United States that you would never see in China? Uh, General Tso's chicken, <laughs> would never have. Um, that's for sure. Uh, chop suey, you would never have. Because actually the, the joke about chop suey is it literally just means like um, sa sui. So it's like leftovers, little bits. So in a way, it's like you think back to like, uh, you know, the mid 1800s, Wild West days. They're just trying to make some dish of anything. So they get a whole bunch of little bits and pieces. They stir fry together and they say, okay, here's a dish. Let's, and it, 
picked up the name chop suey, but it's not a real dish that people would eat. Um, oh, egg foo young, I think is also very Americanized. Um, orange chicken, all those things, very Americanized. But, what, but the beautiful thing about Chinese food is that it is adaptable and it, it, it uh, adapts to the people and adapts to the area and adapts to the whatever vegetables there are. And so you see Chinese food in India, you see Chinese food in South America, you see Chinese food all around the world and it takes on different flavors. And, and in America, people like deep fried food and they like sweet food and that's why General Tso's is such a, a hit um, in America. But if you want to see, where's my class? We're going to watch a documentary film, The Search for General Tso. It's a great documentary and we'll kind of get into all the little details about it. If anyone's we, we did have one person who was asking you to post links to your other talks. So um, we've got some of those up on the screen right now. Uh, uh -huh. If Neil wants to copy that information down. Uh, and also, um, I know you have a website, uh, Francis, and I believe you have your, uh, uh, your upcoming appearances on your website. Is that correct? Yes, and so that's just my whole name, Francis Kaihua Wong, no dashes and no spaces. So it's at the bottom of the screen here, Francis uh -huh. Um Anything I have going on is there. Uh, I think I've got a tab that's upcoming. It's it's not up to date yet, so give me a day. I, I, my site went down <laughs> for a month, and so I'm a little behind. But, uh, but WCC, if you go to the non-credit classes, you can find my classes. I taught a lot of cooking classes for a while, but with COVID, I don't really feel comfortable doing that. So it'll be a while for me doing that again. Uh, she also uh, says, can you talk about almond boneless chicken in relation to Detroit? She uh, says, I think it's the only found in Michigan. Yes, it is a Detroit classic. Uh, it actually is also found, it was created in one restaurant. Um, uh, my friend Bill Kubota at Detroit Public Television is actually making a documentary film about it. But it, it, it came out of one restaurant in Detroit. It's a Detroit classic. After a while, every restaurant in Detroit had it. But they also have it in one restaurant in Columbus, Ohio, I believe, because the son of that original restaurant owner you know, grew up and moved to Columbus and opened a restaurant there. So he took the almond boneless chicken there. Uh, but yeah, that's a, that's a Detroit classic. And also, you know, in terms of adaptability, like Louisiana, they have all sorts of stir fried crawfish and alligator and stuff like that to kind of fit what's going on, fit Louisiana. And so, yeah, so look for Bill Kubota's documentary film. I don't know where he is on that, in that process. Uh, as someone wants to know, what is your favorite Chinese restaurant in this area? Aha! Funny you should ask. <laughs> so my favorite Chinese restaurant is TK Wu Restaurant. It's on Liberty. It's right next door to Don Treader. It's diagonal from Michigan Theater. It's one block down from the old borders. They are great. And it's, you can tell it's, it's a family owned restaurant and um, they are warm, they're wonderful. And when you go there, you find, well, first, well, now who knows with COVID, but uh, before COVID, it was always packed. And it's, it was evenly packed with Chinese people and non-Chinese people. And that is very, very rare. Usually Chinese, you know, restaurants, they, they have a style and either only Chinese people like it and, and non-Chinese don't, or it's only non-Chinese people, and there's no Chinese people there, and that makes, that's something to worry about. But TK Wu has both equal uh, parts. I mean, they have, everyone is there, and they're wonderful. And right now with COVID, they are doing, uh, I think they're doing some in, in-house dining, but also takeout, and they're very careful to, you know, make sure everything is clean. You can order, um, order by phone and then you pull up, you text them and they'll bring it out to your car. And so they're great. Tell them I sent you. I bring, I do a, a Chinese language class at WCC and also my Chinese food class, we, the final exam for both those classes used to be a field trip to TK Wu, but with COVID we can't do that anymore. So 
come back in a few years and we'll, we'll go on a field trip, but you can still go. It's great. It's a great restaurant. Great. Thank you. Um, one question uh, is, is there any Chinese food that you find offensive as a Chinese person? Uh, no, <laughs> I, I don't know what would be. Hmm. No, not really. Huh? I don't think so. I mean, maybe, I mean, I, I, until recently, I'd never had General Tso's chicken. So I was a little afraid of it. I didn't quite understand what it was. And, and I, there were a lot of dishes that I didn't understand, like chop suey. I'd never, it took me years to figure out what was chop suey because we never had it at home. Um, but I don't, I don't know, I, I wouldn't say offensive. Yeah, no, and also I'm a courageous eater. So I, I believe in eating, trying everything. Uh, here's a question. I guess we're on a restaurant um, a theme here. Uh -huh. uh, what, what restaurant has the best dim sum? Oh, dim sum is hard to get around here. Well, I hear that. I think there's only one place that has it, right? The Oh, they changed the name. It used to be called, it's like New Asia City, something like that. Is that what they're called now? It's on Washtenaw, just past Gulf Side. It's on the right. It's huge. It's a big place. They've and they're right next door to a Chinese grocery store. So they have dim sum. Uh, there's also a place in, it's off of 696, what is that place? Uh, I forget what city it is. It's not, it's called Shangri-La. If you look up Shangri-La, it's off, you have to take 14 to two, 275 to 696. You get off at one, like the first exit, Oak something. Shangri-La, you have to look it up, but they, they have excellent dim sum. And then the other place to go would be Windsor. Um, in the old days, there was only Windsor. Um, oh, and also the, the place, what's that place that used to be Great Lakes, which is no longer, used to be a Packard and Carpenter. They used to have dim sum, but they used to be the only Chinese restaurant in town. My mom came when I first moved to Ann Arbor and we went to, to dinner there because it was the only Chinese restaurant. And my mom's like, I can make better food than that. And so she cooked uh, mapo tofu every day for the whole rest of her trip here because she was competing with the restaurant. It was wonderful. But yeah, dim sum is, is trickier. Yes, yeah, uh, someone has, uh, has indicated that Shangri-La is on Orchard Lake in West Bloomfield. There it is. Orchard I Lake in 15. Yeah. Very helpful. Yeah, I knew it had an O in the name. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, okay, I have a, a question. Um, uh, Gail says, my husband found a list of dishes that are supposed to be authentic, including tea smoked duck, mapo tofu, twice cooked pork, dandan noodles, and hot pot. Is that true? Yes. Those are all real dishes. <laughs> They're <laughs> delicious. Uh, you wouldn't eat them all at the same time. Like as a meal, like hot pot is its own thing. Uh, um, but, uh, and noodles you would have as noodles and, and other dishes you have. But yeah, those are all real dishes. They're good. Hmm. I'm seeing, I'm not seeing any more questions. All right, let's see, do I have any other? If you're looking oh, for a good cookbook, this is my favorite Taiwanese cookbook by Kathy Irway, and uh, it's called The Food of Taiwan, and it's got beef noodle soup, which is the like the national dish of Taiwan. And uh, they say what they, they say about beef noodle soup is because in 1949, a lot of people left China and went to Taiwan because it's the end of it was the Chinese Civil War. And because when they went to Taiwan, all these people from different provinces mixed together. And that was how beef noodle soup was created because it's got the, the noodles from the north, the spiciness of Hunan province, the beef up from the plains, and it's all together in one dish. And so that's kind of the great uh, kind of result of, of people mixing and fusion uh, from the 1940s. Yeah. Do I have anything else? I think that's it. Oh, I see I a recipe. Oh, if you want a <laughs> recipe? This is my mom's cucumber salad. It's summer. It's the end of summer. So, yeah, we have three minutes. I'll, I'll leave you with a, a recipe. Um, 
if, if you can make this in two minutes, three minutes, I timed it once. I used to bring this to every potluck I ever went to. Um, but it's end of summer, there's a lot of cucumbers out. And so all you do is you cut your cucumbers. There's something called roll cutting where you cut it, then you roll the cucumber, you cut it, you roll it. Uh, you can find it online, I'm sure how to do it. Or you do in a food processor or you cut into sticks. How, you know, that's up to you. But you, you cut the cucumbers, you salt them, let them sit for 30 minutes and the salt will take the water out. Then you rinse the water out, then you marinate it. One tablespoon soy sauce, two tablespoons sugar, three tablespoons vinegar. And the way to remember that for me is, you remember it's in, in um, alphabetical order in English. So one tablespoon soy sauce, two tablespoons sugar, three tablespoons vinegar, um, garlic, minced garlic is optional, hot sauce, is optional. Sometimes I put a carrot in for color, um, but that doesn't really add to the flavor. But, uh, and there you go. It's in marinated, you know, 30 minutes would be great. Um, but, and, and that's a nice, cool, refreshing dish. It goes well with dinner. And there's a, it's all the rage in New York right now. Um, it was a few years ago, there was a big article in the New York Times and we're like, cucumber salad like we make this all the time like in the summers we make it almost every day and so it's surprising that it was you know it was hot a few years ago looks delicious but uh yeah and very simple right simple no oil if you don't use hot sauce then there's no oil so that's it's light it's cool okay well francis thank you so much this has been really fascinating and um, we, we've kept the audience through the entire talk, which is always a good sign. <laughs> oh, good. Well, thank you all for coming and thanks for having me. It's been great to, you know, talk as best as we can through the chat and I hope you had fun. Yeah, we totally appreciate it. And we just want to remind everyone to, um, thanks to our speaker, um, Francis, Kai Wong Wong, and uh, thanks very much to our friends at the Culinary Historians of Chicago for recording this and helping us with the engineering. And uh, remind people that our meeting next month will be October 18th, and we're going to be hearing about the story of wild rice in Michigan. So you can check our website, culinaryhistoriansannarbor.org, for details on how to attend. Thank you all for coming, and enjoy the rest of the weekend. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Oops.